Stepe Musardo will present us an excursion. Ah, thanks for being here. As you have, uh, I think, easily understood, uh, this has nothing to do with the school. However, I think it's uh, is worth uh, spending probably some time to pondering about one of the greatest subjects, probably mathematics and uh, physics, uh, which is uh, group theory. So uh, during this uh, seminar, we will uh, touch uh, several, uh, several uh, uh, topics. So first of all, I will spend uh, a big deal of time just presenting uh, several uh, apparently unrelated topics. So starting from puzzle, strange particle, you will see platonic solid, crystal, golden ratio, and all that. After that, we see that there is some kind of uh, ABC of symmetry, which is indeed the, the, the group theory. I will just uh, uh, underline very, very few basic result of uh, group theory. This is not going to be a course on group theory. And uh, uh, as well as, uh, sorry, as well as uh, we start, uh, we start uh, uh, spelling better What about so uh, we'll see that uh, under the the how to say the umbrella of group theory there are many many different facets of uh, symmetry, and we will uh, spend some time in understanding some of them. And finally, we'll conclude with uh, a general in Paris, a mathematician in Erlangen. So the part A, as I said, is really a bird eye's view on the subject. And uh, we start from uh, uh, two move chess mat. So this is one of the most beautiful uh, uh, problem in chess, uh, uh, problem in chess uh, composition. And this is due to a famous puzzle uh, uh, composer that is Sam Lloyd. Sam Lloyd was an American, settled in Boston, and in the uh, 1880, just to shake it, essentially all America, proposing on the Boston uh, Chronicle a puzzle. And this was indeed uh, something that became a mania all over the country. So the puzzle was this, take this uh, game, and he say, well, taking this disposition, one, two, three, four, blah, 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 but look, the last two are inverted. And then he say, well, I'm gonna offer $1,000 if you are able, through continuous move, to bring it back to the following situation, okay? Now, you probably have realized that this is the father, really, of a, uh, a lot of puzzles that follow after, probably the most famous one, and uh, probably you have been uh, uh, particularly, uh, how to say, you have the disease with the Rubik cubic that has been uh, probably in the early 70s, where people really all over uh, Europe were trying to solve the, the uh, cube or Rubik. Now this, uh, uh, this cube has many, many configurations, you can count it, actually, and this is the number, which is around 10 to the 19. And among all these uh, uh, configurations, there are some particularly nice, like this one, which was called Mason, as well as this one that was called Quark. Now, this has to do something with SU3, you probably. And indeed, uh, let me just uh, switch uh, subject and uh, really go in the realm of elementary particle, where uh, in the early 90, Murray Gelman just invent a very crazy game in uh, trying to put some order in the zoo of uh, particles that were discovered uh, essentially each day. So in particular, there was uh, a kind of pattern under which this particle organized and, in particular, l using uh, idea borrowed by symmetry, and they call eightfold way, he predicted that should exist a new particle, the last 
on the, on the pyramid I just show that has to be there to complete the symmetry, the symmetry uh, scheme. This was the famous omega minus. So that Kelman predicted, and indeed, uh, uh, experimentalists soon start to work hard on that. And in uh, 1964, this was discovered indeed in Brookhaven. This is it. So this little trace here, you can, uh, was indeed the uh, predicted particle by Gelman. And this was one of the great uh, triumph of uh, symmetry uh, principle in physics. Now, jumping once again uh, subject, I don't know if you have uh, ever uh, thought why there are only five platonic solid. So, you know, there are uh, solid like the icosahedral, the dodecahedron, the cube, the tetrahedron, and so on and so forth. So why the hell there are five of them and not many others? And moreover, what are the symmetries of this uh, of these solids. And moreover, do they form in a kind of regular pattern the solid that we have in nature? Well, the answer obviously is not, because if you think the icosahedral is as much as the pentagonal tiling on a plane, it's impossible to do it. So to make a tiling, tiling or a tiling of a tessellation of the space, you need an additional properties that is the one uh, associated to any crystal, and this symmetry is nothing else than translation. So you need uh, an object which has certain symmetry, which however can be translated by a discrete uh, uh, site. So in this case, uh, I'm just strolling in this direction, but obviously everything uh, becomes regular in this direction. So not all solid allow this, and uh, what were allowed were classified by a uh, French physicist, uh, Auguste Bravais, who ended up in a famous classification of possible crystalline uh, structure. There are only seven of them. If you include also the bases, become 14, but nothing else than that. Now, this looks really kind of a game, but nevertheless, we know that there are immense consequences on physics because the underlying uh, uh, pattern determines the Fermi surface. And Fermi surface determines all kinds of physical properties that uh, material can have. So in particular, one of the uh, more uh, fancy material uh, in recent time is graphene. And indeed, uh, you know that uh, if you study the Fermi surface of graphene, you find kind of Dirac point and therefore this material is pretty peculiar. And you probably know that graphene is indeed spatial on, on this point. So to conclude this, uh, this uh, tour, let me now mention that in 1988, Sasha Zamologikov, a famous uh, Russian physicist, the same of beloved polygon Zamologikov, came across a very fantastic and striking idea the idea that the famous uh, easy model that has been a uh, team of research for decades in presence of magnetic field that was an unsolved problem of statistical mechanics could be solved exactly. And not only that, but he was able to find exactly the spectrum of excitations for the model. And uh, with uh, his uh, uh, marvelous solution, he ended up uh, in uh, a model which has only eight excitations with exact mass spectrum which is here notice in particular this number on which i will comment in a minute and moreover this uh, number fantastically adjust on the simple root of the most exceptional uh, group that exists which is the e8 so this uh, particle can be assigned to the root of this dinkin diagram and this uh, has enormous consequences in all the scattering theory of this theory. Now, the golden ratio, which was the second uh, mass ratio of the theory, you probably uh, know that are associated with many, many patterns in mathematics. For instance, are associated to the Penrose tiling, aperiodic tiling of the plane. 
as well as associated to the uh, most irrational number that you can have in arithmetics. And uh, these end up also in uh, many, many constructions related to the so-called uh, golden ratio, which end up, for instance, taking a rectangular and recursively always cut in terms of uh, golden ratio type. If you connect all of them, you just get the uh, shape of a famous uh, uh, pattern in nature, which is the Nautilus. Okay? So, what is uh, amazing about that, just to repeat uh, Eugene Wigner uh, uh, surprise, is the uh, surprising effectiveness of mathematics. Now, all this uh, is pretty uh, fascinating from a mathematic point of view, but even more fascinating the fact that people uh, went to lab, and this was an uh, experiment done by Alan Tennant, uh, Radu Koldea, and collaborators. Uh, go, uh, they went to lab, they create a special uh, spin uh, chain in the class of universality of easing, and with neutron scattering, they were able, indeed, uh, to compute the correlation function, the spin-spin, and the peak of this correlation function indicated the mass that we're looking for, as well as corroborating, I mean, com uh, confirming all other kind of prediction that such marvelous theory had. Okay, so what all these examples have in common in their uh, diversity is uh, a structure, an underlying structure, and this structure is indeed the structure of group theory, which is uh, probably one of the most powerful and uh, fascinating branches of mathematics. Now, the, let me just uh, uh, underline very, very few few notion on uh, group theory just to put out to say the notation and to be on the same uh, footing uh, all of us. So first of all, what is a group? Well, a group, uh, as you know, is just a set of uh, elements where you have an additional rules here identified with a product that is such that you associate it, two of them to a third one with certain rule. So the, the uh, Things you associate should belong to the same set, should be associative, should exist identity operator, and should exist an inverse. Now, imagine that you have a finite set of elements. You can encode all of this in this, uh, which is called multiplication table. Okay? So, a bunch of uh, letters which tell me C multiply with A, which kind of element will uh, give out. So, what is the main property of this table? Can I take uh, n numbers, put in a table, I have a group? So what is the main uh, property of this? Yeah, which means, imagine I don't know anything. What means closure? Is yeah, this is... So, each line cannot have more than uh, one element equal. So, they are exactly all the same, just permuted. Okay? So, this is the main uh, characteristic of this. And actually, you can compute the probability of creating uh, randomly a group exactly according to this, to this observation. Now, this uh, uh, table can be commutative, namely, the order uh, of the element might matter or might not. So if they commute, the terminology is that the group is a billion. If they don't, the group is not a billion. So everything uh, fine. I'm not uh, selling uh, snow to the Eskimo. I mean, we know very well this. However, I cannot resist the temptation to give immediate a consequence of this, which is striking is uh, a consequences in number theory. So I never tell you how many elements I have. This is called the order of the group, okay? So a priori you might think that you might have um, any number, 8, 9, 20, 21, 39. Well, there is a striking result that says the following. If the order of the group is prime, imagine that you have 19 elements, well, necessarily, the group is going to be a billion, 
not only, but cyclic. Cyclic means that it's made of unique element and powers thereof. Okay? Now, this theorem was proved by La Lagrange. And uh, it's a very simple theorem because uh, given a group, you can identify a subgroup that eventually this group has. But the order of subgroup should be a divisor of the entire group. So if uh, the group uh, is not composite, is a prime, cannot have any subgroup. But this point, you see immediately that if you take powers, this form a subgroup. So therefore, the group should coincide with the group itself. Okay? So, really beautiful. You are pinning down the possibility of groups. But there is even more. You probably know what is called as a little theorem of Fermat. It's not a big theorem, it's the little theorem. The little theorem of Fermat says that if you have a prime, P, and then if you take a B, which is not divisible with respect to the prime, if you take uh, any power of, uh, if you take the P minus 1 prime of B, and you divide the modulus P, the residue is always 1. Okay? So this is the little Fermat theorem. Now, you probably know proof of arithmetic coming from arithmetic of this theorem, but with group theory, it's just absolutely simple. I leave to you to, to think about it, okay? Okay, so then uh, that are the basis of the story, but more important for physics uh, applications was uh, the representation theory. Now, to the best of my knowledge, the first idea of representation theory come from uh, Frederick Frobenius, and it's actually not more than 100 years old, it was 1896, where he had the idea that this abstract set of rules might be represented as a linear operator in certain space, of course, where you associated the identity of the group to the identity of the linear space, and then you should be sure, you must be sure, that the product of the matrices in the space you are representing it should fulfill just the multiplicative law of the things. Very simple. So, you have this group, abstract, and then you are trying to represent in some kind of matrix. Okay? So, this is what you want to do, and obviously, you should look for some kind of dimension. So, Matrices are very natural because encode the possibility to be, to be not a billion. Okay? Numbers cannot do it, but matrices can do easily. And uh, the problem is, uh, given a matrix that uh, stays in correspondence with a group element, what is the dimension of this? So indeed, you would like to know how many different irreducible representations you have because given a, an arbitrary representation like atoms, you can break into individual one, which is called the irreducible representation, are the space which cannot further reduce. But once you have them all, you can combine any other representation you like, just adding. And moreover, what is their dimension? Now, to answer these questions, which are very basic and fundamental, we need uh, just an extra element an extra notion, the notion of class inside a group. So a class uh, consists of all the elements which are uh, conjugate one to the other. So if you think the cube of Rubik consists of all the element that if I do like this, I do like this, and then I turn back with the other one, they are conjugate, okay? So you take an element B, you act G minus one, you arrive something, G, and then this is another group element. So all the elements which are in this relation are conjugate one to the other. Now, the, the importance of this notion is that the class of conjugacy make really a partition of your group structure. So one element can belong only to one class and not to others. Therefore, the entire group should be partitioned in it, okay? Now, they are not subgroup, as you immediately see, because the identity make a class of itself. So, the result is very simple. If you want to know 
how many, so the number of a reducible representation that a group has is exactly equal to the number of classes. So you count them and you know the answer to the first question. And what about the second question? Well, the second question is even more interesting because the dimension of the reducible representation satisfy a Diophantine equation, which looks like this. The sum of the square of them, and their number is equal to the number of classes, should be equal to the order of the group. Okay? So take, for instance, S3, the permutation of three objects. S factorial, three factorial, is the order of the group, which is six, as uh, uh, three classes, and then you have one, plus one, plus two square, make six. Okay? So you know that S3 will have three irreducible representation, one two-dimensional and one two-dimensional. Okay? End of the story. Now, obviously, this uh, has to do with finite group. Now, talking about finite group, I cannot resist uh, to bring up uh, an example which has attracted a lot of attention since the latest uh, uh, 60, which is uh, the monster group. I'm going to tell you more about the monster group late. For the time being, it's enough to know that it's the largest exceptional finite group, and uh, the number of its elements is astronomically is around uh, 10 to the 54. Okay? It's a discrete and has to do with the symmetry of a spatial dual lattices, which is called the Leach lattice, which has to do also with telecommunication. Anyway, this is a long story. For the time being, just uh, take this as a finite group. Now, people have computed the classes. There are uh, 194 of them, and has computed uh, the corresponding uh, dimension of the reducible representation. Okay? So they, they, uh, the one-dimensional representation is always there, obviously. Uh, any group you can represent with the one. But then there are a growing uh, number of these linear space. Pretty, I mean, strange number. It looks like telephone guide number. I mean, nothing, uh, no particular order. However, there was a First, a mathematician, a Canadian mathematician, John uh, McKay, and then uh, Simon Norton and uh, Simon Norton and uh, John Conway, that we'll see later, they noticed a remarkable pattern, absolutely remarkable pattern. They noticed that if you take uh, j of tau, now j of tau is a modular function. Modular functions are those functions which transform nicely under the transformation of the torus. I will tell you more about that later. So you should imagine such, sim uh, such function as a function which endorses a huge symmetry, which are all the symmetry of Mabius transformation. Moreover, this J function is particularly important. There are many, many functions which does so. But this function is particularly important because in terms of them, you can construct essentially all the others might be technical, but it's kind of building block, okay? So, the modular function, as you probably know, uh, share uh, uh, an important uh, property in mathematics. The property of being simultaneously, as, uh, you can simultaneously express them as infinite product, but as well as series, okay? So, they work it out, the series, and uh, these are the numbers. Okay? Now, they start noticing uh, <laughs> this amazing pattern. That this coefficient here is exactly the sum of the lowest representation of the monster. The coefficient here is once again integer sum of the representation of the monster. This one is integer representation and this pattern continues forever. So, I mean, what has to do <laughs> a function which is modular, which is on its life, as all the universe, on all uh, reference uh, frame, with something which is the monster group, which is finite group, I mean, not directly related, right? 
So I leave it uh, for the moment, this, but this was uh, indeed uh, one of the most uh, striking uh, mathematical conjectures that uh, John uh, Conway uh, dubbed in uh, moonshine. Moonshine means all and everything, the contrary. So something that you don't know where, how to interpret this light, which comes on modular function, vice versa, on a finite group from modular function which take really long, long time uh, the attention of mathematic, uh, co mathematical community and finally end up in a field medal in uh, 1998, I think, where it was finally proved. So just to conclude this, uh, this part, I would like to remind that the representation theory is that part which uh, give us the reason of a lot of uh, different, very, very different behavior of functions. So here I just uh, show all the harmonic uh, sphere of SU2. So obviously, if you have a function which share this, uh, uh, this contour uh, uh, shape, you say, well, this has nothing to do with the sphere or has nothing to do with the, this other one. So it looks completely different. It's true, but they have a common root, which is indeed the structure of SU2. Okay? So the message is group might be a unifying concept of uh, object that phenomenologically might look completely different, but they are nothing else than irreducible representation of the same symmetry, of the same algebra. Okay, so that being said, let me just go a little bit more and investigating uh, uh, what kind of group we might have and what kind of application we might have. So, Indeed, a group can be finite of infinite. We saw some example before of finite group, but can be also infinity. Well, as an infinite group might be discrete or might be continuous. And as a continuous might be compact or might be uncompact. And then you might go on a more uh, subtle distinction, might be only topological group uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, I will uh, just give very, very few examples to make more familiar on it. So I will uh, uh, concentrate on permutation group, braid groups, and Lie group. So why permutation group? Well, permutation group uh, is uh, uh, what it says. So it's a permutation of an object that you might think numbers, but it's not necessary, where you associate it to five numbers here and other disposal of the, of the same. So the number of uh, the dimension of the group is uh, n factorial, so it grows uh, enormously. And uh, any permutation, however, can be realized in sequence of uh, transposition. So this is important. Look, for instance, this one. I want to realize this permutation so from the starting from the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you start from this, then you just permute the first two, permute the last two, and the first two once again. So any permutation can be realized in sequence of transposition. But this has a consequences because uh, each permutation is made either of even or odd transposition. So you can associate a parity to the permutation if they are even or odd. And moreover, the even permutation form a group themselves. So this is crucial. In a, in a minute, you will see in a minute why it's crucial. So this is called the alternating group. So the full group is called permutation. This is called the alternating group. So the permutation group is inside a big beast, which is the alternating group. So as itself, technically speaking, is not a simple group, okay? Now, let me come back to some Lloyd uh, things. So you remember I was proposing this configuration to get, to beget from this one. And it was betting an astronomical amount of time. You can even double the bet. Do you agree that to go this is just one transport transmutation? Obviously, right? So let's see how indeed uh, uh, behave this 15 game, how it is called, under continuous move. So let me just do the simple one. I move this, I move this, I move this, and I move this, okay? So I come back essentially to the same configuration, but I've been moving all the square here. 
And now you go and look who is going into whom. And so what you have realized is that uh, you are making a cyclic uh, permutation. 11 was going 12, 12 in 15, 15 in 11. But any cyclic permutation can be broken in uh, transposition. So it's like you have permuted 11 with 12 and 12 with 15. But there are two transpositions. No one, two. So this means that the original configuration, the original problem some Lloyd was proposing can never be reached by any continuous movement of this 15, okay? Now the, the permutation group is important in uh, mathematics for a uh, uh, very, very basic reason. And the basic reason is that uh, it's possible to prove, it's very simple, just uh, the previous observation we just made it, that any possible finite group you can conceive uh, is isomorphic to a subgroup of the permutation acting on G. Okay? So, say differently, if you are able to control all the group uh, of permutation and all the subgroup of group permutation, this is the difficult part, essentially you have control on all possible finite uh, group. So, for instance, if you look at the discrete uh, group, the finite group associated to the symmetry of the tetrahedron, there are 12 elements. These 12 elements are in correspondence with the alternating group of four objects, which are those where you are permuting the four vertex here, but you are not allowed reflection, which is, of course, a discontinuous class. Now, the permutation group is also important because once you classify the reducible representation of it through the Young tableau, it's done like this, for free, automatically, you get also reducible representation of other groups, which are the continuous group. So, for instance, this graph, this Young tableau, associated to SU3, this was the decuplet that Gelman was talking about. This is the famous octet of eightfold way. So this is the mason, and this is the singlet. Okay. But uh, there is even more because permutation group, as a matter of fact, is at the basis of the history of group theory. It's how the group theory was born, and this has to do with Galois and uh, his famous formula for polynomial equations. So let me just uh, uh, go a little bit in it. So the problem, as you know, is uh, come from high school, how to find solution of uh, algebraic equation. Now for uh, square is very easy, we know the formula, but if I give you a generic third equation or fourth order equation, there exists formula, but are not so easy, memorizable, okay? So this uh, uh, problem has been uh, the focus of a lot of attention and uh, dispute along the centuries. And this starts from Tartaglia, that was the first who claimed to have solved the 13 degrees equation. That was immediately uh, entering a very fierce debate with Cardano who published a book, Ars Magna, where this formula was given, and they start quarreling. And the problem was that Cardano indeed steal from uh, uh, Tartaglia that solved the equation with a poem. So he was able to understand <laughs> what was written in the line of the poem and translating formula, okay? So both of them were right, but technically speaking, Cardano was a, a stealer, as was in other uh, facet of his life. Now, you probably know that uh, uh, the fourth uh, equation was uh, completely Bologna school. So here we have Ludovico Ferrari that worked out the fourth uh, formula. But then, since there was an obstacle, so from fifth on, I mean, people tried to find the generalization previous one, no way. There was, apparently there was no way of this, uh, the, the first that uh, spot such kind of impossibility was uh, uh, Abel. But it's true that the guy that made really a breakthrough in the subject was Galois. Okay? So who is Galois? Well, Galois is a French mathematician 
uh, born in uh, 1801 uh, and uh, died, uh, uh, sorry, 1810 and died in 1832, only 22 years old. And he was really a revolutionary in a very turbulent period of French life, was when Napoleon uh, just uh, uh, fall and it was not clear that the Bourbon were coming uh, again of the, then finally were the Orleans that take the power. So he was really a revolutionary and uh, a mathematician as well. And then he enter in, uh, indeed in a game probably uh, larger than, uh, than in his shoulder and finally he was uh, brought to a duel, very common at that time, where he was shot dead. Now the story has a lot of controversy, how this happened, if this was everything was set up by the secret police to get him killed. There were attempts already to kill him uh, when he was in prisons and so on. Or was indeed a duel associated to a love story because he had uh, an affair with a, a girl, a famous uh, Stephanie Dundell, that uh, has been uh, finally discovers many, many years later that uh, was a son, was a daughter of the um, hotel where he was uh, spending uh, this kind of jail. The reason why it was an hotel was in Paris, there was a cholera epidemic. They have to close all the uh, jail and put people in the various houses. So this is a, a page uh, that he edit just uh, the night before the duel. So there are in all these pages there are endless number of S, say for Stephanie, or for whatever, but there are endless number of S everywhere. And here you might see, especially for the French people here, I have no time, you see, you say, I have no time really to, to spell out all the detail of this theorem, okay? So what was the theorem? The theorem was that it's impossible to solve the fifth order equation on. But the reason he found, uh, so apart the statement, you know, in physics or in science, most of the time, or sometimes, is not uh, important the result, but the method how you arrive the result. So he established that what's impossible, that is already a great result, but the method how he arrived it was completely original, and as to do, I'm trying to say in a nutshell what was it, is the following. When you have a polynomial equation, you can always factorize the polynomial in the roots. Okay? Now, the roots enjoy special algebraic equation themselves. So, for instance, the second order equation, if you have uh, x minus x1, x minus x2, if you develop you will realize that the original coefficient b is nothing else than the sum of x1 plus x2. So this uh, equation, as you see, is symmetric in x1 and x2. Okay? So this uh, was the uh, key of Galois to analyze what is the structure of symmetry of algebraic equation made of roots. And then you might ask, why the hell then uh, 5 is so relevant, 5 on, because 5, by the way, the, the, the symmetries enjoy a group of permutation, of course, or subgroup thereof, but 5 is the first non-trivial dimension where the permutation group has an alternating group in it, which is non-trivial, okay? All the previous ones are trivial. So from 5 on, there is an obstacle essentially due to the structure of permutation group of five elements. With six, even worse, of course, seven, and so on and so forth, okay? So this was indeed the born of group theory, and uh, this uh, uh, remained really a, a great moment in the history of, uh, of science that has produced many, many years later, as a matter of fact, the old uh, race has finished in 2004, the race of classifying all possible finite group. Okay? The classification has been obtained, has taken thousands and thousands of pages of publication, and end up in uh, something which uh, reminds very, very much the chemical element, absolutely the same. So there are families 
of group like the diedral group and this and that but then there are like the rare earth you know in chemistry there are here the exceptional group exceptional group like uh, m stay for monster group so this is the largest one m24 what was i uh, talking before then uh, there are others co stay for conway you discover many of them there is co1 co2 co3 is not uh, oxygen not not carbon oxygen but it's conway conway one conway two conway two and there are uh, uh, other which are associated to other name m sorry uh, yeah m was the monster and there are others which uh, uh, which you can classify also associated with the Dinkin diagram so one of the men uh, behind this gigantic uh, enterprise was uh, daniel uh, gorenstein uh, Mar american mathematician that coordinate really like a uh, commandant in charge this troop of mathematician that work for more than 30 years really to pin down all single uh, single uh, cell of this table as well as John Conway that we see here a bit older that has been indeed the one of gi the giant of this uh, of this uh, enterprise and this was one of the artillery dedicated to the monster group now let me add that uh, Conway produced at the end an atlas you can go in the library and consult the atlas that you consult a geographical atlas you want to know where Vietnam is you go open Asia and you find where it is here this atlas contain all the information on finite group you can think of like dimension characters table and uh, so on and so forth did you notice something uh, in this uh, cover well the authors were uh, selected uh, peculiarly they have uh, exactly the same name exactly the same number of letters sorry you see j h conway r t cartis and so on and so forth all of them as a uh, boil on the second as well as the, the <laughs> on the last but one okay moreover what is funny is that they are listed in the order in which they join the project which is exactly the alphabetic order so when they start this uh, this uh, uh, this project they have a special office in Cambridge they call Atlantis but then uh, they change the name because any page they put in this office disappear so they were not able to to find any longer and they change in atlantid in honor of uh, atlas the giant of north africa on which finally they got the the name okay so this uh, is a fantastic book that finally was published by clarendon press oxford but was done in cambridge but uh, anyway this contain all the information you can uh, thereof about finite finite group so going uh, in this example let me just uh, now move uh, on example of discrete infinite group which is the braid group so braid group as you know is uh, just consist uh, in all possible permutation but with history that uh, say uh, lines can make it now this in general can be seen as uh, some kind of also representation in some kind of sun uh, group as you will see in a minute now there is a profound theorem of topology of group that says that any uh, braid that you can make permuting uh, n elements can be always approximate with the precision you want by another configuration where you keep n minus one of them fixed you just make one strolling so this is called weaves okay so there is a there is a way of approximating any braid uh, operation in terms of weaves anyway forget of these are detail i mean it's, it's not it's not the problem so the problem uh, the nice thing is that braids are closely associated to the art of knotting because if you take a braids you take the stream and you close it you have a knot so out of it you know this is a very important problem of topology alias how to distinguish a knot from a trivial one 
or how to distinguish or identify knots which are simply look differently but as a matter of fact are similar. So people have devised uh, tools to do that and to spot why this knot is different from this one, for instance. Now this starts to get very complicated, as you can imagine, but just do, let's do a simple exercise. So if you take these three knots, tell me which one is the trivial one. Can be the first, let's see. Can be the second, mm, neither. Can be the last, yes, <laughs> was the last, okay? Uh, but just to say how intricated the things can go. So even a simple twist can fool you easily. So why this is important? Well, this is a branch of mathematics. You might be fond. It's like a train spotting. You know, you might be interested in notes. Or someone else might be interested in some other things. Well, it's more than that. Because uh, in recent years, I found an enormous application in quantum computation. And I think you have been exposed to lecture here, in particular by Karajan, in which uh, you would like to devise uh, a quantum circuit, which are uh, nothing else than unitary, unitary operator acting on Hilbert space, in terms of something. The point is what you are using as qubit. Now, it's a long story, but uh, the idea that uh, was uh, born uh, uh, essentially by the topologist Friedman uh, field uh, medalist in uh, uh, Q station in uh, station Q in uh, US and Kitaev was uh, to use anion excitations, which has non-trivial braiding, to realize knots or braiding, if you want, that at the same times act as qubits. Okay, so this was the idea, and if this can be implemented. You see, this uh, will solve all the problems that affect quantum computation, which is decoherence, at once. Because we have solved not at the level of software, as has been all previous uh, uh, design of quantum computation, but really at the level of hardware. Because uh, braids, in order to break, you need uh, to break the topology. But this requires gap, required energy to be provided to the system. So it's all story, I'm not going to uh, enter in much detail, but just want to say that uh, you can uh, realize, as a matter of fact, one of the fastest possible algorithms with this, using a special class of anions, which are the Fibonacci anion, which, uh, uh, by the way, can be used as a universal quantum uh, uh, qubit, and uh, a special object that we see at the very beginning alias the icosahedral, or if you like, the dodecahedron, okay? Now, why this is possible? Well, for a very good reason, because a qubit live on SU2, right? But these are the largest discrete group of SU2. So if you can employ them smartly, you can approximate any qubit with the use of this, of this object. So indeed, uh, this uh, brings us to the last example of this uh, list, which is a paradigmatic example of continuous and compact group, which is SU2. And you probably know that everything is born and encoded in SU2. Any other complicated group is made of, of SU2, essentially. So this uh, all quantum mechanics is uh, made on SU2. And by the way, this is the famous postcard that uh, Gerlach sent to Bohr announcing the experiment that proved the splitting of the atom. And they say, well, I don't know if there are German uh, alumni in the audience, you can probably read, say, congratulations, uh, Professor uh, Bohr, you, we confirm our theory. Although they were wrong. <laughs> they were wrong, you probably know the story. The beam split and they thought that was due to the angular momentum of the atom, that was the Bohr theory. But this was for the spin <laughs> that was discovered three years later. So the stern gerlach experiment was done in 1922, but uh, Gulbeck, uh, Goodsmith uh, Ulbeck make the proposal of the spin three years later. 
and was confirmed. So this was a confirmation of the spin of electrons rather than the angular momentum of the, the things. Anyway, was always based on SU2 anyhow. So, you know, one of the proposers, one of the main uh, uh, pushers of the story was uh, Eugene Wigner, and this is one of the most uh, probably uh, important book on the, on the subject, and as uh, one important and impressive book on the subject, but probably this is the place to also remind an uh, Italian contributor, that is uh, Giulio Raca, that was in Florence, was born here, and probably even taught here, right? So Giulio Raca make an impressive number of theorems in group theory, in particular, say J symbol is the one for which is most famous. But if you go and dig in detail, you have a remarkable theorem on the number of Casimir operators that you might have to split uh, the genesis, as, as, as well as on the Cartan matrices, why the eigenvalues are associated to the Cartan, uh, to the Casimir power, and so on. So, absolutely stunning theorem in uh, group theory was due to Giulio Raca. And another important uh, uh, character in the story is Hermann Weil, in which, uh, I mean, this probably is uh, one of the most famous book, technical, professional, but then there are others which are more uh, popular book on the subject. So all uh, uh, behind the continuous group, there is this man. This man is Sophus Lee, born in Oslo at that time, Christiania was quite a character, I mean, a bit a troublemaker. And, uh, but after uh, a while, uh, he find his way in mathematics. He started with astronomer, but then uh, since he was in uh, Norway, it was very cold in the night, so he started to, lie, to warm the place where there were the telescope. So they kicked him out immediately. So he didn't make a l <laughs> they didn't make a career in uh, astronomy, but then they start something in uh, in uh, mathematics, especially because he became a very good friend of a character we'll see later on, which is Klein. Okay, so to him and to another outstanding uh, mathematician, this is the Russian uh, Eugene Dinkin. Finally, we had. Uh, one of the Rosetta Stone of the entire subject, the Dinkin diagram or Lie group. Probably, I don't know any other probably piece of mathematics where an astronomical amount of information is encoded in such economic way. You see? If you know how to read it, everything is here. Everything. So the angle, you know, Dinkin uh, diagrams are relation of roots alias vector because we are talking linear algebra. So Lie group encoded the property of this vector, and these are all and only group of continuous symmetry that you can have. So this is the other phase of the classification program in a finite group. This is done in continuous group. So this, for in particular, this is the root system of E8, the largest exceptional group. So the root system of E8 are 248 vectors that live in eight dimensional space. Eight, E8, eight is the rank. And then the entire uh, root system are 248 vectors, very compact, very tightly uh, organized. How this is done, so you cannot visualize vector in eight dimension, of course, but you can make projector, projection of them. So this is uh, a projection of these 248 roots according to the angle where they are more symmetric. So it's like if you have a cube. A cube uh, looks to you different according how you see it. But if you see through the diagonal of the cube, it's the more symmetric one. So up here, all the other angle and vertex is the more symmetric way. So if you do the projection or the root system of E8 in that way, and this is called Coxeter plane, you get this fantastic picture, where you can read that there are 30 of them, which is the Coxeter numbers, and this, and so on and so forth, okay? Okay, and then uh, let's go now, let's rush to the final part, a general in Paris, a mathematician in Erlagen. Now, general in Paris is uh, this one, 
Nicholas Bourbaki, that in the beginning of 90 start to publish books like crazy on mathematics and try to make re-foundation mathematics all over, okay? So then uh, start to have uh, books on Lie group and Lie algebra, for instance, but as well as analysis, set, uh, set um, theory, and many others. They start to make symphony on algebra, topology, and this on that. And you probably know that behind, this was a pseudonym for a group of mathematicians that uh, used to uh, meet in a famous cafe along uh, Boulevard Saint-Michel in Paris, as well in the private uh, country house of Weil. Uh, this is Weil, and this is Simon Weil, the famous philosopher, and that was the sister. So who were they? Well, there were a bunch of mathematicians, the founders of, the, of the, this uh, group were André Weil and Henri Cartan. Henri Cartan is the son of Elie Cartan, that is one that takes the name of Cartan Algebra, and isn't that was the father, Elie Cartan. Henri Cartan uh, was a mathematician, very close friend with André Weil, and uh, after the first uh, uh, World War, they were very dissatisfied by the status of the French mathematics, in particular in comparison to the German one. And the reason is very obvious, because uh, you know the First World War has an enormous an amount of uh, uh, killing, I mean many many people were killed. However, in France they send to the front anyone of any kind of intellectual level, so essentially, all the generation of mathematicians were completely killed. There was very, very few uh, left. In Germany, it was different because people of certain qualification was not sent to the front. So in Germany, remain a good tradition of mathematics. And indeed, uh, many of them uh, used to pay visit to famous center of uh, Germany like Göttingen, Leipzig, uh, and so on and so forth to uh, to find a new inspiration. In particular, they had, uh, as, uh, uh, as a lighthouse, Hilbert and all this program that he had. So at a certain point, they uh, were uh, indeed very frustrated with the status of uh, mathematics uh, in uh, France and also the way mathematics were taught, was taught. So they try to, they decide to build up from scratch all the foundation of mathematics. Now this uh, uh, start to grow as a group and the rule is, uh, this was uh, said by Raymond Kino, the writer. Say, Bourbaki never become old. By the way, Raymond Kino was associated to, to them for many other reasons, associated to literature. And the reason is that the rule they have is that when you arrive to 50, you have to resign from the group. Okay, so Bourbaki never become old. So there has been always a uh, uh, generation change. So along the year, there has been a Ricartan and Revail that found the group, but then a famous exponent was Laurent Schwartz, the Schwartz distribution, always due to him. Jean Diodonne, that was a kind of spokesman of the experiment Bourbaki for uh, many, many years. And as well as Claude Chevalier, that made an important group in uh, contribution group theory, the Chevalier basis is due to here. Jean-Pierre Serre, famous, uh, famous mathematic, uh, mathematician of arithmetics, and many, many others. Okay? So they indeed were a very influential uh, group of mathematicians that indeed start to write this book. Now you probably know that Bourbaki has always created passion, reaction. So there are someone that dislike them at all. And the reason is that uh, they pretend to found the entire mathematics on set theory and to have rigor in their, uh, their way of approaching. In uh, none of their book there is a single figure. Figure are abolished, like they, they, they are afraid of figure. So at the end of the day, people uh, thought that they uh, actually act more as uh, obstacle to the development of mathematics, or this kind of rigor mortis, people say, rather than uh, 
something which was propositive. Now, many subjects of mathematics, they were not treated by them. For instance, all mathematical physics is missing from the element of Bourbaki and many others. However, it's true that books like Lee Algebra, Lee Group, still today is considered one of the, of the master of the series, okay? Okay, and then uh, the uh, mathematician in uh, Erlagen, this is Felix Klein. I'm talking 50 years back now in time. And uh, uh, absolutely an uh, outstanding figure of German mathematics, coming from school of Göttingen, Gauss, and many others, Riemann, where he proposed uh, to refound the geometry that was discovered, all the non-Euclidean geometry was discovered a few years uh, uh, back of his, uh, of his uh, time, on the basis of group theory, okay? On the basis of group of symmetry. So he, had, he would like to understand and to make the program, it's called the Erlangen program, to uh, build up the entire geometry as a group of transformation. So this, uh, he was very fond of wine, as you can imagine, so he invented a bottle, the Klein bottle. Probably it's hard to, to drink, but it's the way it is. And uh, using uh, ideas of his, uh, of his master, that is uh, Gauss, indeed uh, he tried to understand the geometrical properties of various, uh, various uh, shapes in nature, in particular curvature and so on, just using uh, transformation. So the idea was action, kind of lead transformation. What is going on uh, on the figure if I act on that? And uh, moreover, invent the Klein function that are the father of Fuchsian function and Mabius later, in particular, which are the transformation of the tori. Okay, so all the transformation which at the end of the day leave the torus invariant. And so, talking about the torus, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, uh, resist to talk about the molar group of the transformation, and in particular, uh, a pillar in theoretical physics, which is the ADE, once again, ADE, the series of simply laced algebra classification of all the possible conformal uh, invariant uh, partition function two dimension done by a famous physicist, not all, but uh, a great friend of mine. So with this, though, this I'm finished. Thank you. You want a tricky answer or you want a fair answer? <laughs> well, fair because it's better to see a young people than an old one. <laughs> but probably because they did, uh, it's not true actually. Some of them, they did a great contribution when they were uh, old actually. So it's not true. I was saying, well, you do the best of your production when you are young. But it's not true. Some of them, they did uh, some important work when they were late. So, well, Lee, after all, was not so young. I mean, he has a white beard. And uh, Gauss was middle age, maybe. So Gauss was very productive till the very end. So some of them died very young. So even if I want, I cannot put the old picture. So. Well, uh, just a, a simple answer. You, when you um, mention the monster group and the relation with this uh, modular function, on one side you have a finite set of numbers, yeah. and on the other side infinite. So what is the relation? I could not understand. This is a fantastic, uh, first of all, as I say, this was a fantastic uh, problem for mathematicians, where they were absolutely stunned 
to find in the coefficient of a modular function this kind of uh, integer relation with something which is finite. So as I say, it took uh, really probably 30 years or more to understand what's going on. And at the end of the day, the answer is due to Professor Capelli, essentially. No, no, I will tell you in a minute. No, but it's true. People acknowledge this. It's the modular invariance idea. So the story goes like this, the, the steps. There were uh, uh, Igor Frankel and co-author in Berkeley. They, they noticed uh, uh, that you can construct what is called vertex operator. This is a uh, standard construction in uh, conformal field theory. But you have to say where this operator act on, okay? So a priori is, uh, is, I mean, is open. However, uh, if you uh, make a vertex operator construction on string theory, so this is the point, and you require modular invariance, String theory, as you know, is uh, uh, an internal space and uh, somehow they are un uncompacted. So if you make the hypothesis that the space, uh, un the, the space on which the string is compactified has a spatial symmetry, which is the Leech lattice. So you have uh, an object that simultaneously has an internal space, which is the Leech lattice, because it's to, to have self-dual lattices, and there are only few. Of, of them, you can classify, and this Leech lattice as the monster as internal symmetry, okay? On the other hand, this symmetry, this uh, string has to be modular invariance. So if you compute in one way, you get the J. If you compute in the other way, you get a sum on the internal index that are the monster. So this is uh, how you explain this uh, fantastic moonshine conjecture. So is uh, based on modular invariance or unique object, which is string, and therefore you can compute in two different ways. So if you compute in one, you get J, essentially, I mean, or a function thereof. But if you can compute the other, you see the degrees of freedom in this internal space, which are the one, you know, when you have a symmetry, you decompose everything in terms of characters. But the character are nothing else than the dimension, the reducible representation. And so this is why become this fantastic match, okay? So a long story and very, very important in mathematics, and I think it struck the attention for probably more than 30 years or so, even more probably. Which are important open problems in... Uh, Sorry? Important open problems in group theory. In uh, group theory itself? By group theory itself uh, has been classified essentially all uh, this uh, finite group. So there is a huge this classification which has been remarkable. The continuous ones, uh, compact is uh, the Lie uh, algebra by, given by Dinking. But then there are all the essentially open uh, uh, realm associated to non-compact group and their uh, representation so on. Quantum group, where the representation theory is not so straight, and as well infinite dimensional algebra, like <coughs> Birasoro algebra, just one example about all the katz moody algebra. And um, I mean, this is already a pretty large bunch of problem that, uh, I mean, are mathematical problem, I'm not saying anything, but probably that sooner or later find application in physics as many of them has already found, right? Because Virasoro, matter in uh, conformal field theory and all critical phenomena. Verzumino model uh, is based on uh, katz moody algebra as well. There is a problem of com constructing the non-compact version of it, which has uh, acquired more and more momentum in recent time. And they are complicated, it's not, uh, not really easy things to, to do, as well as, I say, the quantum group, which is a uh, uh, generalization group to structure, which is uh, a little more sophisticated. These are the first uh, example which come to my mind. There might be others, I don't know, Andrea, you have other... Uh, well, other uh, uh, there is the classification, proposed uh, classification of topological... Uh, uh, state of matter, topological insulators, uh, with the K theory. Yeah. K theory is a, is a part of it, yeah. K 
Ah, let of, me mention uh, also. Theory. Let me mention also also to another one, which come uh, while while, you know, a uh, uh, um, class very very close to group theory are the so-called uh, fusion fusion algebra of uh, topological uh, matter, and uh, are uh, essentially what is called also Berlin the algebra associated to Berlin. So are kind of. Uh, self-consistent set of rules in which you combine object. Let me just make the simple one. So you have three objects, which are oh, four, sorry, not three. You have identity, that has to be algebra, is a identity, sigma and epsilon. And you combine in certain ways, okay? Now this is, uh, once again, associative rules that you can uh, encode in the matrices, like the uh, adjoint representation, and you find that all these matrices should commute. So this is the requirement to have self-consistent. Now, once again, you have the Galois theorem, which block you to have a, f a, finite rep a finer word on the representation of this. Because if you want to classify all possible matrices which commute, you have imposing that exists an orthogonal matrix which simultaneously diagonalize all of them. But to find an orthogonal matrix, you have to solve algebraic equation. Now, more than five, you know that you cannot do it. So once you, again, you have uh, objects which are pretty interesting in physics, at this kind of fusion uh, algebra, important for topological reason, topological states of matter, quantum computation, and so on and so forth. These are nothing else than uh, the rule of anion fuse. But you know by basic principle that you cannot classify all of them. So any breakthrough coming from other sources, I'm saying if you face the problem directly, no go. But any other uh, attack that might be found from different angle might be a very important uh, step forward. I think there was Calvin. Ah, and I was there. How would Riemann and the open, the, 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 the Riemann hypothesis fit into the story? Um, well, Riemann, I don't, I don't directly, I cannot directly associate to group theory, uh, at least not. Uh, what, what do you have in mind? You see, because group, I mean, Riemann hypothesis is on a different uh, status in mathematics, on a different uh, lane, a different uh, way of handling. As far as I know, but probably I'm not, uh, you do not handle through a, a group theory angle. But maybe I'm wrong, I mean, but uh, I never heard anyone uh, try to enforce group theory argument to, to understand what's going on there. I find a, a completely different, uh, the Riemann hypothesis itself. Obviously there is a formulation when you start understanding statistics of uh, the, the number and this and that, that you formulate in terms of random matrices, or unitary group and this and that. So if you have that in mind, okay. But the direct problem, attacking the direct problem, why they are on the line one half, as far as I know, no one has really tried to attack from group theory argument. I'm probably wrong, uh, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, we thank again the speaker. Oh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>